first. So I'm Lindsay Bita, and I'm a developer at BrandNewBrand.com, and we're going to be talking about anti-oppression, uh, which is something that's extremely important to me as I entered you know, the field, and I noticed that no one else sort of looked like me. And Hi, everybody. I'm Steve. Uh, as you may or may not know, I teach the best Ruby and Rails classes in the world with Jeff over there. So if you need to get better at Ruby, you should give us a call. Uh, yeah, and I care about this stuff a lot. So Lindsay and I put this talk together to share these concepts uh, with you. So when we say anti-oppression, what do we mean? Well, so one of the things that I've been really interested in lately is um, applying the languages and techniques of other fields to ours. So basically, like I've stopped listening to all of you and started listening to people who do things like uh, philosophy or you know the humanities stuff. And I think that there's a lot to be learned from an interdisciplinary approach, right? So like everyone is concerned about the startup echo chamber, and I'm kind of concerned about the programmer echo chamber um, in general. Not that I do anything to not contribute to that, but you know whatever. I'm on Twitter just like everybody else is. But, so I came up with this analogy that I think is pretty reasonable for how to think about other fields. So um, in Ruby, we love DSLs, right? Like Rails is a DSL to write web apps. Um, we just use DSLs constantly um, for everything, basically. Um, Rake, you know, all sorts of stuff. And so other languages have these domains that are not programming. And so they also need to use language that addresses that particular domain. So what's unfortunate is whenever we encounter a domain that's not ours, we sometimes assume that we know what words mean because we use them in our regular context. But in the context of a totally different field of study, a word that you may be aware of means something else entirely. Um, it seems pretty obvious, but it's really easy to forget. So um, what we're going to do today, basically the point of this talk, is to present the ideas of social justice as a DSL for solving the inequality problem that we have in programming. So um, you know, just remember that th this is sort of an overview of terminology that you may think you know what it means, but you may not fully understand what happens when people that care about this stuff talk about it. So um, we wanted to share it with you. So first we're going to start with some data. So right here is a graph of the bachelor's degrees in various uh, STEM fields. So that's uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And we notice this red line here is computer science. So this peaked around 1985, 1986. Um, right when I was born. Yeah. It's all your fault. Cool. <laughs> um, so you know, clearly there was a lot of interest and suddenly we have something dropping off and it's still a negative trend. We have had some small increases recently, but it's an overall negative trend. And what we have right now is about 23% of uh, women, of the people receiving degrees are women. Uh, there's a similar issue. So we talk a lot about like women in computer science. We need to understand that this is an intersectional problem. So this affects multiple people and multiple areas and different experiences and stuff. So what we have here is sort of the race breakdown of all US workers compared to the workers in Silicon Valley. And we see for Hispanic individuals in Silicon Valley, they only make up like 9%. And the overall workforce, they make up 15%. For uh, black people, it's 6% compared to 11. So that difference goes, OK, that's not that much difference. But then you think about it, you realize that it's half. And that makes it a staggering amount. So there's something at work here, something going on that are keeping multiple people from different backgrounds from entering this field. So yeah, so this is sort of the data that supports this problem. And so um, there's this field called, well, not really a field exactly, but maybe um, a term that certain people use called social justice. And it is essentially a DSL for discussing equality in social relations. Um, now, one thing that we want to definitely emphasize, so like I'm sure that a lot of you read my Twitter, and so this is not necessarily about politics. Um, social justice as a term actually originates from Thomas Aquinas, and it used to be a very conservative, religious, we need to help those who are less fortunate kind of thing. So this isn't really anything to do with like um, my normal like rah, rah, smash the state stuff. This is about like being humans to other humans, regardless of whether they vote Republican or not. Um, they're still people. And so I, mean, I say that in all seriousness. Like this is, this is a bigger topic than petty political squabbling. Um, th and this is what, the, what it really gets down to is, is like we're all people and we should be treating each other as people. Um, and that's important. And it's easy to forget sometimes because we deal with computers all the time. Um, so uh, a long time ago, some of you may know that I used to read Reddit a lot until I got really, really upset and quit. Um, but there was this really great thread that happened um, about Reddit that I think that illustrates one of the biggest concepts in this field and one of the ones that's hardest for us to understand um, as programmers. 
And the, the, it was an Ask Reddit thread, and it said, what's the worst thing that you can call a white male? And people were like, somebody said, like, cracker. And they're like, ha that doesn't bother me whatsoever, right? It's like totally ridiculous that I would get upset about this word. And then someone said, privileged. And then all of a sudden, everyone got really upset. No, 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 I'm definitely not privileged whatsoever. I, I worked really hard. I did all my homework in high school. You know, yeah, maybe I went to private school, but like, that's because my parents worked really hard. And like, there was this huge, like, no, 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 no. And so it's really, really um, amusing um, in general that that's, that's what gets uh, us and me um, upset, mostly, is by accusing us of this like, social privilege. This is like the most key um, cornerstone concept to understanding social inequality is, is privilege. Um, yeah. So privilege is how society accommodates you. Um, you know, it's like sort of the things that you get when you enter a situation. It's how you, know, you are being treated one particular way because you're presented in a particular way. Um, it's actually situa situationally affected. I had a friend who, um, he's a Korean-born person. He was adopted into an American family. And when people were reading over resumes, you know, he has sort of a name that people associate with him being like white. But then when he comes into uh, basically to get interviewed, they look around and they say, oh, you know, Zach. And they look over and they go to this one guy, you know, who wasn't him, and they look at him. And so he had privilege in like getting the interview and stuff because he said, you know, people thought that that's who he was. But then when he was actually there, you know, it was a totally different situation. And it's basically kind of like a luck thing. You don't really sort of, you don't have a control of this. Yes, some of these things can change about you, you know, like your religion may change or, you know, other things can change as you grow, but a lot of it is things that you're born with. You're lucky if you know you're a white male and you're entering the computer science field. Just, it's kind of how it is, because you're sort of the norm, it's what people expect. And, yeah. So the privileged and the unprivileged live on the same planet, but two different worlds. The experiences that I have are completely different from the experiences that Steve has because of who we are. And it has nothing to do with, you know, me choosing to be this short woman. It's like, you know, this is who I am. This is how I present myself. I don't have a choice in that, really. There's a really good um, blog post that happened a little while ago that you may have seen me tweet about where um, somebody compared the idea, this idea of privilege to um, difficulties in video games. So like if you have privilege in a situation, then you're playing the same game but on an easier mode. And it's not even that you'll necessarily notice that like things are simpler, um, it's just that things are simpler and you just sort of assume that's true. Um, another sort of example of this like these social norms or privileges, so I was at dinner recently with um, a lady friend of mine and uh, the person brought the bill and he went and handed it to me. And I made a big deal of handing it to her because she was paying. And uh, she put her credit card in the thing, handed it to the waiter, and he said, thank you, walked back, ran the card, walked back out, handed the bill to me. <laughs> and, you know, so, like, this is these kinds of things where this is, like, a social norm, um, you know, that, like, people, like, every day, you just, oh, this is just the way things are, and so you're treated in this special way because you happen to be male-identified. Um, so there's this really cool um, sociological experiment called the Invisible Gorilla. Um, basically, um, these, they wanted to do um, this study on perception. So they told all these people, we're going to show you this video, and it's going to have two teams. One's going to be wearing white jerseys, one's going to be wearing black jerseys. They're going to pass basketballs back and forth to each other on the screen, and we want you to keep track of the number of times that each team passes the ball to each other, and so we want you to tell us, you know, the black team passed the ball ten times, and the white team passed the ball five times, or whatever. So then they showed them a video, and um, afterwards, you know, they did this with a bunch of individuals. They didn't do it in a group. And afterwards, they asked all of them, okay, so um, what did you think of the gorilla? And they're like, what do, you, what do you mean, the gorilla? And they're like, the gorilla that walked across the middle of the video. And I don't know what you're talking about, said most of the people. So they replayed them the video again, and in the middle of these jumble of people passing basketballs, this dude in a ridiculous gorilla suit walks over and is like <laughs> waving his arms, and then he walks off the frame. Um, and so the reason that people miss this, and you can see the video on YouTube if you want, um, and I totally missed it the first time that I watched it as well, um, our brain is not really good at paying attention to things that are in our periphery. So we tend to um, focus on things. And so especially when you prime someone with the idea that you need to count these basketballs, you focus on that, and since the color of the gorilla suit is similar to the color of the people on the team, you just totally ignore this like, blatantly obvious thing if you weren't trying to focus slightly. And so this is really what um, a good metaphor, I think, for the idea of privilege. So like, as a person who is privileged, you won't notice the ways that you're privileged because 
you are normal, so it's situation normal. Um, and so it's really, really difficult to notice the ways that you are privileged if you have privilege in a given situation. And that's one of the things that make this concept really hard to um, identify with and to address, um, especially if you have a lot of it. If you're a straight, white, middle class, male dude, um, it's very difficult to notice all those things together. So what Steve went over was his personal axes of identity. And so it's all these things that sort of like make up who you are and sort of affect the privilege that you receive in what situations. Yeah, this is a list of just five of them, the gender, sexuality, race, class, and ability. But there's a lot more at play here. Um, you know, being cisgender and stuff does give me privilege that, you know, the transgender people don't have. And it's really important to keep in mind that you know, a lot of these things are at play and nothing is really quite so cut and dry. It's one of the things I have issues with a lot of the data that we collect about people in, you know, computer science because we're looking at it at a, like a really base level. We're only looking at it as like gender as being male and female and there's a lot more going on there. We don't do any studies about sexuality and there's very little data about race actually, which is surprising. And one short note of what we mean by ability here, this is like um, if you uh, have mental health issues, for example, or if you're handicapped, not like I'm really good at StarCraft versus someone else is kind of okay at StarCraft. We're talking about like physical ability. There were some questions last time we gave this presentation about what ability, what we meant in this context. And that's actually one of the harder ones to notice, but anyway. Um, so intersectionality is how all of these things are interacting at once. And a lot of them lead to, you know, basically systematic oppression of these people and inequality. And it's something that we need to really keep in mind. And it's one of those things we need to keep in mind as we push forward and we you know, push for more women in the field, we need to keep in mind that you know, we're leaving other people behind if we're just talking about women in the conversation. We need to be very, very aware that we are talking about increasing everyone's ability to interact in this field. And it's, it's something that's always kind of problematic anytime you push for like, you know, basically equality in any situation. Sometimes someone gets left behind and it's time that we stop doing that. This is also a common derailing tactic of people and you say like, oh, oh well women you know, don't have as much social power and they're like, well, what about that woman who's a CEO? You know, that one woman who's a CEO. So there's intersection between all these different kinds of things that make up, like people aren't just one attribute. So it's important to acknowledge them as whole people instead of you know, just pigeonholing them into one particular part of their identity. Um, this is something that is really controversial on the internet, and that's because uh, nobody studies these kinds of things. Um, you may have heard people say previously like that you cannot be racist against white people, for example, and then there's huge arguments about what that means. The, the issue comes from this. So the isms, specifically racism and sexism, but also ableism and classism and all those things, um, basically it's, it's an equation of discrimination plus power equals the oppression. So the reason that people say things like, uh, you cannot be racist against white people is because racism is about systemic inequality across all of society. So you can discriminate, obviously, against any particular category of these things, but if you are the, if you are the dominant or the most privileged along any of these particular axes, then it is impossible for you to be ismed because they're talking about a bigger societal force. And this is something that people don't really appreciate. Um, in many ways, and this derails tons of discussions online um, because people get into these details about what these words actually mean. So when you use the ism, you're talking about broad social issues, not like you know um, a particular interaction or one instance. Um, so. Okay, so imposter syndrome is when people are un unable to internalize their achievements, you know, despite any sort of evidence that they are you know really good at what they do and they think that they're basically frauds. And this is something that affects a lot of us. I know uh, Steve has talked about, you know, sort of experiencing this imposter syndrome before. I've definitely talked about it. But when you're sort of like a minority in the field, it sort of kind of like crumples down on top of you too. Because I, I remember like getting a job and I'm like, am I getting this job because I'm a woman or am I getting this job because I'm genuinely a really, really good programmer? And basically trying to get that through to yourself and basic, trying to internalize these achievements is something that's actually extremely difficult to do sometimes, and it's sort of surprising. There's all this evidence there, but despite all that evidence, you just can't accept it for what it actually is. So one of the situations I love bringing up is you know, going to just any sort of tech meetup, and the really, really problematic thing that I've ever been asked is whose girlfriend are you? And even more so, I've had multiple people basically ask me, you know, if I'm dating Steve, 
which I'm not. Yeah. And it's happened over and over and over and over again. And it's, you know, you're in a situation and you're trying to present yourself as a programmer and everyone's like, oh, you know, who are you dating? What, which man in this room are you here with? And it's like, no, I write code. I, this is what I do with my life. And that sort of like builds upon this imposter syndrome, right? Because I don't feel like I belong in that situation. This happened two or three days ago. I got lunch with someone who I know through the internet, and he said, like, didn't I see you tweet something a couple months ago about you cutting your girlfriend's hair in the same way that your hair is cut? Um, and I shaved a bunch of my friend's heads like, a couple months ago, but they're all also programmers, and I retweet them all the time, so people are like vaguely familiar with my friend's group, but that was the thing that he remembered was, like, I think that you're a woman attached to this dude, not, like, you know, anything else. So it's really, really common in tech events, and numerous women talk to me about how this is, like, something that really bothers them, and it should. So, um, yeah, so the stereotype threat, um, this is something that's really, uh, I, I'm assuming, obviously, I can't really experience this at all, but um, so a stereotype threat is a very common thing where uh, you have anxiety from, um, you don't want to perform in a way that would reflect negatively upon your social group in general, right? So I think you had an example of this before. Yeah, uh, actually, the really interesting thing about a lot of studies that say that women perform poorly in math is that they prime them with gender ahead of time. So anytime you get a group of people together and you say, okay, you know, women tend to do bad on this exam, and they take that exam, they do poorly. If you go ahead and you say, you know, actually, there's been studies that try and say this, but that's actually false. They did that study, and suddenly the difference in their performance was the complete same. There was identical performance. So this priming with gender and basically telling them, you know, this is what your, your gender does. And, or actually, they even did this, you know, with African Americans, because for a while, they're standardized tests. And it was actually in 1992 when they did this study. And they found that the moment you said, you know, your group of people does poorly, they perform poorly. And it's because when you say that, you're putting their mind in sort of like this anxiety state. You know, they're not gonna perform as well anyway because they're stressed out. They're like, you know, I'm, you know, my type of person does poorly. Oh no, I have to prove this wrong. And you know, this isn't true about me. And you know, the moment you put someone in that, they're not gonna perform as well. And yeah, definitely because society has a sort of idea that women, you know, aren't good at math. It, or, it just, you know, the moment you bring it up again and say, here, take this math test now, it's gonna stress them out and their performance is actually hindered from that. Here's one of my favorite things that programmers say that are terrible. Um, I can't be sexist because I love women so much <laughs> and I love looking at them all the time. That's not, po it's, uh, oh, the variant of this is like, my slides couldn't be sexist, my wife helped me pick out the pictures. Uh, so, you know, the, these are kinds of things that you may, like, run into that, yeah, we can, like, laugh about, but they're, they're often, um, you know, way more subtle, right? Like, this is the most blatant form of this argument, but um, people do make them in more, in more subtle ways um, as well. Uh, one of the things that is really important, and this has come up a lot in discussions about, like, conference talks gone wrong, and et cetera, is that this stuff is really hard, um, and you should apologize uh, honestly when you get it wrong. Like, I don't think that there's value in making people give fake apologies due to demanding to the, you know, the witch hunt. Like, if you are being a sexist jerk, then you shouldn't pretend to not be a sexist jerk. You should just say, yeah, I'm a sexist jerk. I'm not going to apologize for it. I don't think it's really productive to fakely apologize. I also think it's important to apologize if you do something wrong, even if the other person doesn't feel wronged. So one example of how I have been oppressive in the past, um, I went to a conference, and the night before, somebody tweeted, like, I'm excited to see so-and-so, 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 and at Steve Klabnik, or somebody I'd never met before. Um, I'd never been to this particular city. And so... Um, I saw her um, in the crowd before, like in you know the social event, like morning coffee social, um, before the conference. So I walked up to her and said, "Hey, are you you know so and so on Twitter?" And she's like, "Yeah." And I was really nervous because I, it's weird to like talk to people that you've never met before on Twitter. And so I made some sort of like in my nervousness, I made some sort of joke about like, "Yeah, I mean, I didn't know if it was you or not. And I didn't want to be like that dude." But how many blonde women are there here, really? And then I felt really terrible about it afterwards, as I should. 
Um, but like, even though I care and think about this stuff all the time, you know, it's tremendously easy to slip up and be a jerk to people. And so um, I didn't apologize immediately, even though I felt immediately bad because it already was super awkward enough for me to have this interaction and that was the reason I screwed up in the first place. But later in the conference, I went back and I was like, hey, I really wanted to apologize for what I did earlier. And she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I singled you out as being like, you know, a woman here and like, that's really wrong. And she was like, well, I don't really feel particularly wrong by this. And I was like, well, that's fine, but I just wanted you to know that like, I feel bad about it and I wanted to apologize. Um, and so that's one way you know, that like, it helps um, because you never know if someone, maybe she, in this particular instance, she didn't feel wrong, but what if she had actually got her feelings really hurt, right? Um, and especially since I was speaking at that conference, right? Like I have an extra amount of privilege from being on the stage too that I have to acknowledge. Um, so microaggressions are demeaning implications or other subtle insults against minorities. Um, these sort of happen a lot. It's sort of like that everyday reminder that you are a minority and that you're of deviation from the norm and that you're sort of, you know, outside of that. And like my basic example is that like doing dishes is woman's work. There's a my favorite one is um, Obama is so articulate, <laughs> right? Which is just like straight up racism, but like is not. It's like people don't think it is for some reason. Um, or like backhanded compliments are one of the common, like most common forms of microaggression. Um, and just for a note, there is a website called microaggressions.com where you can see a huge listing of these. And anytime someone is like, you know, give me an example of like something where you've been wrong, I was like, you can go to the site, and most of these have probably happened to like one of the women that you know. Okay, so frown power was basically Stetson's Kennedy's uh, solution to racism in the 1960s. He was infiltrating the KKK and kind of trying to bring them down a bit. But we really need to stop kind of being silent when someone is doing something wrong. And I've noticed this increasingly, especially on Twitter right now, which is really cool, uh, despite the fact that we're all being called, like, you know, we're doing a witch hunt, apparently, when we call people out on being assholes. But we should call people out on being assholes because the moment our community is basically accepting of people being dicks, we're going to end up with a community full of dicks. We need to stop that. And I hate to use genitalia as a pejorative, but I'm going to do it. Um, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we really, really need to let someone know when they're doing something wrong. Because sometimes they might not know. And yeah, I, we all make mistakes. I've done it. Steve has done it. Like Probably everyone here at some point has said something that was you know, inappropriate for a situation. And if you just let someone know that they're doing something wrong, you know, they'll think about that. And that's really, really, really important. And if you know, they continue it, keep calling them out, and then call in the Twitter army. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna speed these last ones up a little bit because we're running a little low on time. But um, this is a common thing from film, actually, that um, is uh, hard for us to notice as dudes. Um, the male gaze. So it's anytime the audience is put into the perspective of a heterosexual male. So my favorite example of this from recent times is um, there was an article uh, in a newspaper about like, what if other sports in the Olympics were filmed like we film women's volleyball? And like, so like every women's volleyball photo is, uh, you know, basically just like ass, right? Like that's it. Like disembodied, like nothing from like here to here, from behind, like that's in this women's volleyball. I even saw one article where the, it was like, an unattributed woman is playing beach volleyball. And it's like, you don't even like deserve to have a name at all. Like regardless about the textbook objectification involved in that photo. Um, and so uh, one of the women that I'm friends with said like, yeah, you can literally be the best in the world at your chosen field of endeavor and yet you're still nothing more than your body to most people. Um, and so this is awesome. This particular photo had like men's basketball with just like, you know, butts in shorts and like <laughs> diving. And they were just pointing, you can see obviously how ridiculous it is when you're taken out of that context. But um, yeah, so male gaze. So I have a Francis E. Allen quote and because we're short on time, I'm definitely not gonna read it. But the key point is that technology is sort of shaping the world and it's really important that it's accessible to absolutely everyone. So that everyone can be able to use this, interact with it and actually create it. So what we create is colored directly by who we are. There have been situations where, you know, because someone didn't take in the considerations of other people, there, you know, have been technologies created that, you know, there, there's the, you know, the face tracking stuff. It didn't work with dark-skinned people. 
that was a huge problem because you know that's a massive part of the population. It's an HP camera. Yeah. If you didn't see that story, we could talk or, about or it. the Nikon camera and anyone who is Asian, it was like saying, "Did you blink?" Like clearly, you did not test this with anyone that wasn't you know the people just working on it. So it's really, really, really important that we're a diverse community, the people creating this technology, so it's able to help those in the entire world because the world is not all white dudes. It's a really, really diverse community and we need to make sure that. We like, no one saw that Pinterest was really popular, right? Like everyone on Hacker News is like, Pinterest, whatever, and then all of a sudden it blew up and huge, and that's because it has certain demographical um, you know, interests uh, that aren't the dudes on Hacker News, so it's important. And we don't want to give off this you know, image. The problem is if we create all technology from the perspective of me, uh, then we tell people like Lindsay or everybody else that they don't belong here because it's a boys club or you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's really important to note that even the few women that were able to get into the tech field, we're losing them. They're dropping life lives because once they enter in, you know, this sort of oppression stuff continues. You know, offensive, sexist jokes in the office. I know it seems like, hey, this is just a joke, but these things actually seriously actually cause mental stress to people, and they have you know, studied basically putting you know, these helmets on people to track the brain waves, and then telling them sexist jokes, and noticing that there's a mental stress response every time that's told. So the tech field, we have a really high rate of attrition for women. It's actually 41% of women, uh, within the range of 10 years, they will leave the tech community, and 17% of men. And so simply by reducing the female attrition in STEM by 25%, we can add 220,000 people to the talent pool, which is massive considering that all the companies are starved right now for talent. Everyone's always saying, we can't find talented people, we're trying to hire like crazy, and it's extremely difficult. It's, at the base, we just need to get more people in and we need to be more opening, open to other people. And here's another quote I'm not gonna read, but... <laughs> Same general sentiment. Yeah. But yeah, so ultimately we need to do better about this stuff, right? And like we are all working on it um, as Rubius, especially. Like it's, I'm really glad that we've been able to have this conversation. And in general, like we are discussing it and you know whatever. But um, it is really, really important, I think, that, that for all these aforementioned reasons, um, especially about shaping the technology of the future. And so here's a couple things briefly that we can undo to continue to help in this way. So uh, the first one is to encourage anybody who um, has any interest at all to continue with that. Um, you know, interest in computing or math or science, whatever, whatever it is, because often, again, this process of weeding out, people drop out, even before they go into degree programs, right? Like, uh, little girls playing with their science kits but told that they need to get played with Barbies, right? Like, that she could be a scientist someday, but instead, you know, is not, because we quash this interest at a young age. I mean, I started programming when I was seven, right? So, um, and you're even more impressionable then than before. So contributing to projects that help learners is extremely important, and uh, Steve, sort of started maintaining Hackity Hack after really lost why. And it's really, really important that we have these tools out there for learners to actually learn a lot easier. I remember when I first started, I was downloading code and copying and pasting it and changing things until I got it to do what I wanted it to. But it's much easier now and we can make it even easier for everyone to continue to learn on their own. Um, and it's also really important to mentor those who need help getting started. It's really difficult to start programming. I'm sure some of you remember it. I was 12 when I started, so I was asked a bunch of hackers what my first language should be, and they said C. And I was like, okay. So I had fun learning about pointers when I was really young and didn't quite understand what was going on. But you know, if I had somebody there basically helping me along the way, that process would have been way smoother. I didn't really understand fully what was going on until I started working on robots, and that was like three years after I started programming. Uh, obviously, eliminating bias and stereotyping as much as possible. Um, when you grow up in like sexist, white supremacist America, you can't ever eliminate all of your bias. Like we've been uh, indoctrinated with this stuff from a young age. So it's it's not so much that we can all instantly tomorrow be totally you know um, oppression free, but it's important that we continue to like sharpen the sharpen the saw and continue to work on these things. So like for instance, um, my current project is to eliminate bitch from my vocabulary, which has been really hard. Um, I uh, have managed to already eliminate saying things like retarded, for example. Like, I used to say that a lot when I was in 10th grade or whatever, and that's really terrible. But I managed to cut it out by persistently paying attention to the things that I say, and I'm a better person for it. So, like, keeping this cycle going um, as, like, a lifelong project will help. Um, 
And then also we need to create ultimately a culture that makes people want to stay. So um, not that I think that everything needs to be perfect before we bring more, bring more women into tech, but if we're all a bunch of sexist assholes, then why do I want to bring more women into this unsafe space? Right? Or if we're all going to do and say terrible things, like I don't want to bring little kids into a programming world where we're going to treat them poorly. So it's also important that we make sure that we're creating the world that we want to live in um, and that, so that that way someday we can get there. Um, it won't be easy and it won't be tomorrow, but I would like to you know, someday have that world exist. And so I'm a woman of my world, word. I'm doing this. I'm trying to help. And so me and Julie, if she will stand up or wave her arm somewhere are starting Girl Develop at Pittsburgh. And uh, keep in mind that this is open to everyone. Uh, it's focused on women, but we definitely want everyone to be involved because both me and Julie care a lot about this intersectionality issue. Um, and so we're trying to help. We're trying to bring women in. We want to start up mentoring programs and everything. And so hopefully we can help, you know, try and turn this, you know, downward, you know, trend around and get more people into the programming world. because. Programming is the, the best thing I do. It's awesome, and I wish more people could experience that. So, yeah, thanks for listening, and we're now uh, out of time, but, uh, yeah, it's been awesome.